So welcome everybody. This is uh, the Neurologist Video Journal Club, and today we will discuss around multiple sclerosis and autoimmune neurology series. My name is Massimo Filippi. I am full professor of neurology and the head of the Department of Neurology here in San Raffaele, Vita Salute University in Milan, Italy. And with me there is uh, Professor Paolo Preziosa, who is uh, uh, assistant professor at, at, the, at the same place. So we will try to um, discuss um, this paper, this recent paper that came out uh, late, uh, late part of the last year, 2022, which is uh, from the San Francisco group and which is entitled Differences in Age-Related Retinal and Cortical Atrophy Rates in Multiple Sclerosis. So let me start with a few background words, um, which are pretty, um, very well-known concepts, but I think they are central for setting up the scene for subsequent discussion. So we know um, progressively better, starting from the late 80s, that there is neuroaxonal loss in multiple sclerosis, and that this is, as expected, a, rele a relevant substrate of disability progression. Most recently, we understood that uh, neurodegeneration in the mass starts from the very early phase of the disease, perhaps even before the clinical onset of the disease. It becomes more and more severe along the course of the disease, so it's much more severe in progressive MS patients. Nevertheless, uh, since this is the basis for fixed neurological deficits, uh, there is a major issue to understand the chronology uh, for which the uh, neurodegeneration uh, accrues in multiple sclerosis in order to be able to um, possibly prevent it or at least cure it or uh, slow down the uh, accumulation of disability, which is the most important issue related to uh, MS, uh, considering that we are treating people that are pretty young with all their life in front of them, with possible um, consequences, not only medical, but also lifestyle, and also on, uh, on uh, working activities, as well as on their uh, future family plans, and so on. So uh, the pathophysiology of the tissue damage in MS, it is likely to result from an immune-mediated Myelin targeting inflammatory effects in the early phase. So we have severe inflammation in the early phase, which might also result in axonal sufferance and possibly axonal death. On the longer term, however, there is also chronic inflammation, which is then compartmentalized within the CNS, which it is a sort of low grade uh, innate uh, autoimmunity mediated uh, inflammation which goes on uh, over time, also outside of the lesions. Uh, there is failure of remyelination, aberrant glial cells activation, mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress. So all of these uh, cooperate to uh, produce uh, tissue damage. On the top of this, we have to remind that there is also uh, aging, so brain of people with MS ages. And this is, uh, of course, uh, um, a sort of possible other aspects related to degeneration, also considering that there is immunosenescence and, uh, um, and so also uh, and comorbidities. So also all of these aspects should be considered. Uh, uh, so the next point is to uh, which tools do we have for monitoring or detect and monitoring uh, tissue damage in MS? For sure, among the two best tools, there is magnetic resonance imaging, allowing us, among many other things, to quantify atrophy, which might be in the brain, in the spinal cord, and within the brain, either global atrophy or uh, uh, atrophy or specific strategic structures within the brain. As well as we have OCT, optical coherence tomography, which allows us to uh, open a window on the retina, which is the only part of the CNS which is accessible directly and which is not uh, hide, hidden behind the, the skull or the, uh, uh, or, or the vertebral canal. So based on this, the first question is what is missing? So 
And what is missing is mainly uh, try to respond to this question. So how do different age associated mechanisms affect the rate of neurodegeneration in people with MS in different CNS structures? Of course, this is a, a critical question to be answered because as I said at the very beginning, chronology of neurodegeneration is central, not only to understand how it, it progresses, but also to predict which is which other uh, tissue parts are involved, and so possibly have a way to monitor whether how the disease progresses on the one side and whether we are able to uh, reduce such a progression on the other. So, um, and I think this is. Uh, part of the story, which is uh, central in the paper that I uh, quoted a moment ago. And, uh, and now I would ask to Professor Preziosa to highlight the main points in the research hypothesis and so on, uh, which are the basis for this important research uh, data, which, are, which have been published in New York. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Filippi, for this very elegant introduction, because uh, I think this is really relevant before starting to discuss uh, this uh, interesting and relevant study. So as I briefly mentioned before, the main research question was trying to explore which were the possible differences in the different brain regions of the and the retina regions to understand whether the pattern of atrophy may be different according to age, but also in the different brain regions and CNS regions. And in particular, in this study, the authors focus their attention on two brain and CNS compartments, which are the brain cortex and the retina. And the reason why that is that they have uh, different situ architectures. They are maybe involved in different ways by MS during the different phases of the disease. As, as we wrote down, the retina is mainly uh, composed by neurons and axons. So if we are able to detect abnormalities in terms of atrophy and irreversible tissue loss, we might think that this may be mainly due to the loss of uh, neuro sona, neuro neurons and axons. Conversely, the cortex is slightly different, so there is a greater heterogeneities in neuronal subtypes, so we know that there are six different cortical layers, and beside the presence of neurons, we know that there are also other cells, such as oligodendrocytes, and so at least the deeper cortical layer are full of myelin, and so the presence of irreversible tissue loss in the cortex may be due not only to neuroaxonal damage, but also to demyelination. Sorry to interrupt you, Paolo. So we could say that this is a major plus of the study. Absolutely. So we are not using, the, the authors did not use redundant techniques, but they were clever enough to use uh, in a smart way different approaches Absolutely. to understand the nature of tissue damage. Exactly. And uh, this is interesting also because their research hypotheses were very interesting. So the first aspect was that possibly inflammation across the disease course might be different. And in particular, the author suggested or hypothesized that neurodegeneration is faster in the first stages of the disease. And then there is another point, which may be a matter of a discussion, maybe also during this presentation, because they say that by evaluating the retina, OCT may also help to measure neuroinflammation mediating neuronal and axonal damage, maybe earlier than MRI, but we will discuss about this point later, yeah. which is the relevance for sure of this study. Clearly, as already Professor Filippi uh, presented, the understanding of the different dynamics may also contribute to better understand the pathophysiology of the disease, but also to implement a specific therapeutic decision making and to design also randomized controlled trials with a specific measure of the neurodegeneration included as the outcomes. So this is an, an, another very important point because this is a sort of an unmet need in uh, general in daily life uh, practice on MS, as well as in clinical trials. We have very well developed the so-called neuroinflammatory axis in order to monitor the inflammatory aspects of the disease. And of course, as you know, virtually all trials that have been conducted on many compounds in multiple sclerosis have assessed uh, clinical and MR markers of inflammation, which is peripherally driven. So for MRI, for instance, gadolinium um, enhancement or new lesion formation on T2-weighted scans. 
And we have a real need to have additional markers to assess and to be early enough to pick up signs of biological progression, which sooner or later will become a clinical progression. And in our view, we really need to prevent these aspects before, uh, I mean, we should act before we have a clinical progression if we wish to be really effective, even with, with presently available drugs in order to really modify the course of the disease. So uh, moving to the methods of the study, uh, the author recruited from the University of California, San Francisco, within the EPIC study, a very large cohort of patients. So uh, 597 patients for the OCT-MS cohort and a slight bit of a lower number for the MRI study cohort, so 430. Two, and here you can see the main demographic and clinical variables of the different MS patients included in the study, which are quite representative of a population of mainly relapsing remitting patients, but with a quite long disease duration, so not probably from the earliest phase of the disease, and a mild to moderate disability. The good point of the, and the another strength of the study is they were able to uh, evaluate longitudinal these patients with a very long follow-up for the MRI cohort, so 10 years, and a slightly uh, uh, shorter follow-up for the OCT cohort, but anyway, quite a quite long follow-up, so 4.5 years. So can we say so that uh, uh, the, the sort of uh, population we have in front that has been studied in this study is uh, somewhat resembling the typical uh, relapsing MS cohort, which is uh, the major part of the people coming to our wards and, and uh, exactly. outpatient clinics. So uh, perhaps the only, uh, so this is another major class of the study, which is based on a very large sample of people with yeah. MS. And uh, I, I find particularly interesting that the EDSS is very low. So we are in, in that phase that we discussed already several times in which we might be able to change the fate of the disease. Unfortunately, as you said, there is a slightly too much longer disease duration, but of course, uh, to, to collect such a large sample, I understand that uh, it challenge. Might, might be challenging, yes. Okay. And other good point is that uh, this is a monocenter study. So both the OCT and MRI assessment and analysis were very well standardized with the maximum, the, be uh, the best uh, protocols. So, so both for OCT with very good quality control reporting data and OCT measures. And this is the same for the MRI with the acquisition of a 32 weighted sequence and with the quantification of cortical gray volume and its longitudinal changes using FreeSurfer, which is a well-known and standardized software to quantify uh, cortical gray matter atrophy. Is there any reason why the authors just focused on cortical gray matter? Because once you have a 3 d t one weighted scan, yeah. you might measure several different structures. The idea is to, to really focus on a structure like the cortical gray matter is because uh, they uh, uh, suggest, and this is absolutely true, that cortical gray matter atrophy was one of the most relevant substrate explaining clinical disability and disease progression. And so this could be a really relevant MR outcome also in possible future studies and clinical okay. trials. Very good. Uh, so moving one of to one of the most relevant part of the results, here you can see the main findings regarding OCT assessment and MRI assessment. Moving first to OCT measures, what the author found is that when they try to dif uh, differentiate, divide patients according to their age, so into four quartiles, so below the age of 35, between 35 and 41, between 41 and 49 and above 49, the authors interestingly found that the rate of uh, retinal uh, thinning uh, was very high, so faster uh, when the, the subject were younger. So in the youngest phase, so in the youngest quartile, and then there was a drop and a stabilization of this rate of, uh, of atrophy of the retina. So a decline above the age of 35, which remained more or less stable. And this difference was statistically significant compared to the youngest patients. 
The behavior was uh, different uh, regarding the cortex because uh, what the author found is that again, the rate of, uh, of cortical atrophy was highest in the youngest population, and there was then a progressive decline over time without reaching a, a, a level, a bottom level, so a progressive decline over time. But okay, we have to consider that this was faster at the beginning, but was still present already in patients, still in patients which were quite old. And uh, this uh, was associated with significant differences in the rate of atrophy with uh, a significantly faster atrophy found in youngest population compared to all the other quartiles and also between the second and the fourth quartiles, suggesting a progressive decline over time. So thank you, Paola. I think there might be two main questions here. First of all, uh, how do you explain the different, or how the authors explain the different behavior uh, of OCT findings compared to MR findings? So which I, I believe could be uh, uh, ascribed to the different tissues as we discussed before, but I'd like to hear what you think. And the second question that we know pretty well, that especially for uh, atrophy measured on MRI, but I guess some sort of similar reasoning can be done for OCT findings. Uh, we know that there are several physiological mechanisms such as hydration, the, day, uh, the hour during the day, um, drinking alcohol and so on that might impact on, on, on uh, atrophy measures. So it, there has been done some work to correct for this in the study? Yeah, absolutely. These are two very key questions. Maybe we can start from the second one, because the author, after describing these very interesting findings, uh, tried to uh, do some sensitivity analysis, such as to explore whether specific possible compounding factors may be associated with a different patterns of retinal and cortical gray matter atrophy. And so they first evaluated the possible effects of relapses. So they categorized patients um, keeping age uh, as uh, different subgroups according to the total number of previous attacks, so from 0, 1, 2, 4, and 6. And they did the evaluation both for the retina and for the gray matter cortex. And what they found is that for all the different groups, so independently from the number of previous relapses, the differences between age quartiles in both retinal and cortical gray matter volume didn't change. So again, patients in the youngest phase of the, in the youngest age, so below the age of 35, were typically associated with a faster decline of retina and cortical gray matter volume independently from atrophy. Uh, even though this pattern was a slightly different, it remains statistically significant, except for the number of relapses above six. But this was just a matter of statistical power because the number of patients was quite Much low lower. to obtain. But uh, the, the trend was clearly evident also in this, uh, in this phase. Very, so this is a very interesting first sensitivity analysis. The other part, which also is uh, very important, is related to disease duration, because we know that possibly the rate of inflammation and atrophy and so on may be affected by the disease duration. And uh, what has been found by this author is that, uh, again, uh, the uh, impact of disease duration may be limited, ex uh, 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 especially before uh, a duration, a long disease duration. So in patients with uh, just one, two, or five years of disease duration, the pattern was maintained. So with the highest rate of atrophy in youngest population, this was lost in patients with a longer disease duration, but this is quite clear because it could be related with a longer disease course, so an age of a biological onset of the disease, which may be long lasting. Uh, the pattern is quite similar also for the cortical remeter volume, with uh, even though there was a slight difference because this was preserved again also with a longer disease duration. So a possible uh, demonstration that maybe gray matter atrophy of the cortex might be influenced, may occur also after the, uh, a longer disease duration, so after 10 years of disease duration, and this is uh, something that has been also suggesting to contribute uh, to disease progression and conversion to a progressive phase of the disease. 
The third very relevant sensitivity analysis was then performed considering the possible effect of disease modifying therapies. And uh, what the authors really found uh, very, very important is that they grouped uh, treatments uh, or treatment type into the four categories. So no treatment, modest treatment, which included interference, glatiram acetate, and tenotunamide, moderate efficacy therapies, which included fingolimod and dimethylfumarate, and finally, high efficacy treatment, which were mainly monoclonal antibodies, so natalizumab, anti-CD20, and other tools. Can I stop you just for one second? So how, how was the case that there were patients with no treatment with MS? Because nowadays, I mean, it's uh, difficult to not yeah. to treat these people. And so I guess it were all the cases, perhaps. Uh, this has not been described. Could be this could be the case. Could be also due to possible patient's choice not to be to be treated. Could be also the desire to become pregnant, uh, for instance, in some females. And this could be all possible uh, explanation. But clearly, it's quite surprising that uh, there are patients are receiving no treatment. So what? And what about the classification between modest, moderate, and that? Beyond that. I mean, there could be some controversies about that. Uh, I mean, for instance, it could be debatable that maybe there is a difference between teriflunomide, for instance, and dimethylfumarate. So, I mean, uh, what, what anyway, it seems quite interesting is that at the end, the main results are not related to four different categories, but uh, to a dichotomization, because the not, not treatment or modest treatment seems to be associated with a faster rate of atrophy, again, in youngest population. This is not the case with moderate or high efficacy drugs. So in any way, this dichotomization seems to be a little bit more relevant. So suggesting that if you treat well soon, you really impact on this. Absolutely. This seems that it might strongly and significantly influence the rate of atrophy, especially in younger population. Okay. Absolutely. And this happens both for the retina and for the gray matter cortex. So uh, what can we conclude from uh, this study? And so then we can also enter to the preview, the first question uh, raised by Professor Filippi. So we found that, uh, and this study showed that a faster rate of, rate of atrophy occurs in the retina, in the cortical gray matter, and this uh, is uh, observed mainly in younger patients with the mass and seems to slow with age. The uh, authors suggested possible different pathophysiological processes, like a progressive reduction of occluding pro-inflammatory status and inflammatory events. And this is quite well known, since we know that the number of immune T2 lesions, gut immune lesions, and their lapse rate is significantly higher in youngest population. And so the presence of inflammation might also determine the occurrence of atrophy. And there is also another interesting aspect. So the presence of uh, some uh, pathophysiological processes that might counterbalance the accumulation of atrophy, like astrogliosis, uh, an increased amount of activated microglia, and possibly, but this is quite uh, debatable, the capacity of neuronal cell protection that might counterbalance the presence of atrophy. And uh, this, the first uh, relevant aspect of, of this uh, study is that clearly there is an effect of age. So a critical consideration also to design clinical trials, to so evaluate studies and so on. And this might be also particularly relevant considering that we know from the clinical experience that uh, also the number of patients with a late onset of MS might be increasing over time. So Paolo, can we say that uh, of course there is a faster rate of atrophy, whatever measure you use in the younger people, but still, uh, albeit sometimes it is not statistically significant, there is still something going on also in uh, people with, you know, with in higher age. So suggesting that, of course, the main part of the game is played during the initial phase, but we should also consider that the older people can still gain something from, from treatment. Absolutely true, because this is just a, a different rate of atrophy, but the atrophy still occurs in patients with an old age. So especially these patients may be also at higher risk of uh, becoming progressive MS patients, so we should prevent in any age this uh, risk of uh, progression. Good. 
This is a very important point. Yeah. Another point, uh, which is quite interesting, which maybe the server further investigation, also maybe further studies, is that uh, the changes in the rate of neurodegeneration may be different in the retina, in the brain cortex. And so... Uh, this was my previous point. Yeah, exactly, absolutely. So above the first age quartile, the, the rate of atrophy in the retina seems to remain relatively constant. So a faster rate of atrophy and then a sort of uh, fluor effect. Conversely, in the cortical gray matter, atrophy progressively declines with age. So it's still higher in the youngest people, but uh, never seems to fully stabilize. So it's something which is going on over time which could be the possible pathophysiological, but also I think methodological explanations, which have been raised well, quite well by, by the authors. There are possible different tissue susceptibility to inflammation related damage due to pseudoarchitecture. So we previously discussed about the amount of neuron, axon, but also myelin. But also age, so younger people have much more inflammation. Exactly. And the protein distribution immunologic target. We discussed, for instance, about the distribution of myelin as well as a possible neuronal vulnerability because, for instance, in the cortex, we know that there are several neurons, interneurons, and so this may be completely different. Clearly, we should also take into account that there are possible differences, some methodological limitations or aspects that should be taken into account, so sensitivity and so on. Uh, which are the strengths of the study? Clearly, the very large sample sizes, both for OCT and MR measures, the application of standardized and systematic data collections, so all the patients have all the different data in a longitudinal setting. And that there are, in my opinion, in our opinion, very relevant sensitivity analysis, the effect of treatments, disease duration, and clinical relapses. And another mention that we didn't discuss, but is relevant, the authors, for instance, since they explored the retina, did not remove the patients with a previous history of optic neuritis. Because I think that this is a good point uh, to really explore the rate and the impact also of inflammation in the eye and in the retina. We should include all the different populations, so not just only with or without optic neuritis. And so this is a very good point. So to summarize this uh, part pretty in, in, in short, is that this is a very important study, I would say, with several uh, strengths. I, uh, we would recommend that anyone should read it because to at least those people, neurologists that are mainly devoted to the treatment of multiple sclerosis and for sure for residents in neurology, this is an important paper. So the next point is around the limitations because I mean, we are in- a... As a, For every study, there, is, uh, there are some limitations and which are very cleverly uh, raised by the authors themselves. So, so the age of the first OCT was uh, older compared to the age of first MRI. And so this was explained by why that some patients undergo MRI several years before starting the animal assessment of OCT. And this may also contribute to the different also pattern of atrophy progression, which may be steeper in, uh, in uh, OCT and uh, more linear uh, in uh, in the cortical green matter. Uh, there is also another point, a, statistic, a statistical aspect. So the author applied the linear mix model, which may be relevant to include the nested data, but uh, maybe the pattern of atrophy may be nonlinear over time. So maybe com several component factors might, be, might influence in a nonlinear way the rate of atrophy. And uh, the last one, uh, using the uh, disease-modifying therapies as time variant coverage, which is a very good approach, maybe not anyway take into account uh, potential carryover effect and delay onset. So the possible need for several months of a different drug to become effective and the possible interplay among different therapies. So if that, that might be nonlinear effects is shown by the authors themselves, because uh, I mean, at least age yeah. shows that the there is not a, a linear decline in brain volume. Yeah. So a single subject could be better maybe to explore also something nonlinear because at, at the group level, yeah. it's, it's clearly demonstrated that it is nonlinear for okay. sure. So, so, uh, so, so future steps. So um, Paolo is a researcher in the field of MS, imaging field of MS. So is going now to give us some possible future evolution starting from this seminal study. Yeah, absolutely, because uh, this study was very interesting. 
And so uh, in my mind uh, arises uh, a lot of uh, questions. For instance, the idea that uh, the uh, pattern of grammatical atrophy in the cortex typically is not random. It occurs following specific patterns. So, so it could be also interesting to explore grammatical atrophy of the cortex at the regional level. So something like in pure neurodegenerative conditions exactly. where we have a spreading of the pathology. Exactly, so it's not random also in MS, so it could be relevant. Clearly, the author focuses on the cortex, but we know, for instance, that maybe the pattern of the thalamus and deep metanuclei could be completely different because they could be affected in the early, from the earliest phases of the disease. Uh, other relevant structure could be the hippocampus, the cerebellum, but probably one of the most important for them could be the spinal cord. So uh, we can do everything. So which one? I understand the spinal cord. Is there another one among the remaining three that we would uh, yeah. study soon, sooner Absolutely. than the others? Because there are also some very interesting evidence. Some, some of them are from the same group, from the San Francisco group, others from also our lab, suggesting that the rate of spinal cord atrophy could be faster, especially in the earliest phase of the disease. And this, again, as was, uh, what Professor Filippi already mentioned, this may be a very good window for therapeutic opportunity. The other point which could be relevant is that uh, um, the authors did a sensitivity analysis considering their relapses, but clearly clinical relapses could be completely different in, according to topography, functional system involved, severity and recovery. And so this may also influence the rate of atrophy, as also the topography and the number of focal point lesion uh, or localizing cumulating in specific CNS topography might promote atrophy in specific brain regions. The last point, in order to better explore also the possible mechanism of the different disease modifying therapies, is mainly to uh, differentiate or the, the different drugs. Because okay, this, uh, the author did a quite interesting classification, but uh, we know that uh, the mechanism of actions of the and their efficacy on the neurodegeneration may be different according to the different molecules that we are exploring. And uh, in this regard, we should say that we are uh, facing a new phase of uh, treatment of in multiple sclerosis so there are several ptk inhibitors which yeah. is new molecules that uh, are likely to enter the treatment arena in multiple sclerosis there are several on the pipeline and so we know that these are small molecules that pass through the blood brain barrier and they might act both on uh, innate and adaptive immunity so uh, this may be uh, additional work for the future to understand whether these measures are impacted differently by drugs that we, for instance, differently to what happens for big molecules such as monoclonal antibodies, plus also the intact blood, blood brain barrier might impact directly on complex neutralizing inflammation. So uh, I would, uh, I do hope that, uh, I mean, we were able, and Paolo especially, so I thank Paolo very much for the Great summary of this important study, which is enters in inside a, a large story around the mess, which has been built up, as I said before, during um, the last uh, 20 years with a significant acceleration during the last few years. And this is a table taken from the editorial, which uh, was associated with the study that we discussed. And I do believe that this uh, table uh, pretty well summarizes not only the findings of this paper, but what we know around the pathophysiology of the mass and the possible therapeutic opportunities we have. So it is likely that we have uh, um, we need to use immunotherapies to uh, affect the relapse phase and the relapse rate during the initial phase. We need immunotherapies for the chronic inflammation later on as well as neuroprotective. So we are pretty well, okay? In this part, this is more complex to think to neuroprotective therapies and regenerative therapies. And so we should consider that this study again shows that there are different trajectories during the different, uh, I mean, this is ages, but could be different phases of the disease or different disease, uh, duration of the disease in which we, um, we have uh, uh, faster neurodegeneration in the initial phase, we readdress the point that there is still some uh, degeneration going on, so we shouldn't stop treatment, 
But anyway, the main best window of therapeutic opportunity, as we know since a few years now, is to treat early, and perhaps as we have, we have seen before, also to treat if stronger uh, from the very beginning. So the idea of high uh, effective early treatment is really central for multiple sclerosis. So thank you very much for following us uh, during this uh, uh, overview of this important paper. We do hope to, to have been useful and thank you very much once again. Thank you.